Cricket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. The Rugby Podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously. Hello and welcome to Rocket with me, Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. Today we're chatting about how the latest lockdown news affects rugby, the best coaches we've both worked with and Sarah Beckett closes the show with a little song. Rocket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. So, Nick, uh, another week in lockdown, but um, I, I'm sure you were glued to the tally at seven o'clock uh, last night. Uh, stay alert. I mean, uh, well, I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what you think, but it's all a bit it's all a bit weird because no one knows what that means. <laughs> if you're in Scotland, it means one thing. If you're in England, it means another. If you're in Wales, it's something else. I mean, it could have been a bit clearer, couldn't it? And uh, it's a bit bit of a nightmare, really. Yeah, well, actually, I missed the first eight minutes of it and uh, quickly went to turn the TV on. Um, and it turns out that I didn't really miss much. It was sort of uh, stay at home, go out, but stay at home. Sort of uh, go <laughs> see your relatives, but make sure you don't see your relatives sort of thing. So there's a lot of contradictions going on, wasn't there, and bumbling. Oh. Um, look, you know, there's, there's many discussions going on today without us joining in in terms of um, the mixed messages and everything. I think... He, uh, I think he's very poorly advised, Boris. Very, very poorly advised. And um, there's a very, very young cabinet, isn't it, that he's got. No one with real experience in there. Um, they've got experienced scientific advisors, but I'm not sure whether his briefings are led by them. Um, he leaves a lot down to common sense, doesn't he? He leaves a lot down to common sense with people because he's a liberta- libertarian or whatever the word is, libertarian. Um, mm. likes to give people their freedom um, but unfortunately most of the population isn't like that they like to be told what you can and can't do because otherwise they'll flaunt it you've seen already the tubes this morning already back to okay not not what they were pre-lockdown but certainly a lot busier than they have been the last six weeks and yeah. certainly not social distancing yes some have got masks on and uh, apparently the return to work was meant to be Wednesday not today, just, but even that wasn't a... clarified. But I think what we can discuss um, is, and I've sent a few texts out to players and agents, haven't really got a definitive answer back, but when he said you can, if you can't work from home, then you must get back to work or you can drive to work. Then that, yeah. that, that, Try and drive to work. So don't use public transport. So as far as a rugby team's concerned, they all drive to work. Not many, if any, use public transport. Um and they obviously can't work at home because it's a team sport and you'd be out on the field practicing their skills if they still have to be socially distancing so there's no contact involved. Is Does that mean rugby teams are, uh, are back training? Well, I mean, I know football started a few weeks ago. I think Arsenal were, were doing that socially distancing. The problem is in rugby, you know, you're all handling the same ball and, and obviously there's, there's contact in rugby. You may have read, which uh, which I find hilarious, and you're a good. I think you're a good friend of Hugo Monu, saying it's great now. Rugby can change. It's going to be much more open. We're going to have uncontested scrums. We're going to have a new style of rugby. And I thought, is the world gone mad? Am I missing something? Rugby is about contact. It is about having huge lumps in the front row with very low IQ. You know what I mean? It's a, it's about it's a contact sport. What are they talking about having no contact for and changing the face of rugby for for a bit? I mean, even John Mitchell said, I'm really looking forward to coaching the guys differently with the new social distancing. I was thinking, listen, I mean, I've got, I, I, I don't know what, what's happening at uh, your club. It's Wimbledon. Is it Wimbledon? Is that right? What's your club? Well, mate, I don't. I think. I think. Uh, as far as the amateur, look, this is again opinion, mate. And yeah. as far as you know, you talking about Hugo and John. Um, I think that they don't really want to do an interview about it, but they're doing it, and uh, t- you know, towing the PC line, and you know, not trying to get into a controversial discussion about it. But we know what rugby is. We've spoken before on this podcast, especially recently, yeah. about not having too many changes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, look, rugby right. without scrums is just like not rugby. That's a different sport. So you might as well just say, right, we're done with rugby now. We're not playing that. We're going to create a new name for a new sport, and that's it. That's the end of it. UFC are back. Dana White yeah. uh, decided that he's going to make his own rules up and uh, forget the rest of the world. And uh, well, they were meant to be coming back, but I think someone tested positive in that. I'm not entirely sure. 
of the details. But uh, I'm I'm coaching at um, well, I've just I'm, I haven't started yet, but uh, for next season, I'm going to be coaching at Wanstead Rugby Club, and um, and I I've got a feeling though, uh, you know, if if rugby if they do change the way rugby is played. I did say if there's no contact, I fancy making a comeback. I could probably still play because <laughs> there's going to be no tackling. But it's it's frustrating because how do these amateur clubs plan for the future? Because I can't see until there's a vaccine that rugby will be in its present format will be allowed, will it? I just yeah, I think uh, I know. I was, yeah, I spoke to uh, the, uh, the the chairman, the chief exec. Oh, sorry, the chairman at Wimbledon, and you know, I've had conversations with other you know head of head of schools rugby, and they're they're planning. The rugby will not be taking place in the winter term, as we know it, September to right. December, and the amateur clubs are planning that it goes back in January 2021. Um, right. Because, you know, they're taking a much more realistic um, viewpoint of it and uh, preparing, you know, to sort of keep the club going in, in various different forms and, and, you know, using their initiative to, you know, run, you know, okay, I say social events, but obviously socially distant events and, you know, maybe doing other stuff to basically um, allow the club to function. Um, you know, it's a situation we're in. It's unique, uh, certainly unique to our time. Um, and, you know, the, the world's got bigger. You know, businesses um, and challenges are obviously much bigger than what they were when mm. the Spanish flu was around and previous pandemics. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to make the adjustments. But the professional game... Uh, you know, you, you say, okay, so they go back, they're touching the same ball. Well, you can wear gloves. So there's an opportunity for a rugby manufacturer or a glove manufacturer to go and make a bit of money by selling gloves. And it's the same with golf and tennis. They're saying, right, you can play golf and tennis. I understand maybe a few other yeah. sports. Horse racing's gone back, going back in France this week. Um, is, okay, tennis, you're touching the same ball. Well, wear gloves. You know, surely play if you really enjoy those sports, playing tennis or playing rugby with gloves as much as you might despise wearing them is better than not doing it at all. Um, yeah. if, you're, if you're that concerned about it, I know obviously with professional clubs as well, I'm sure that they'll have rigorous testing um, the night before, maybe when they leave training. Uh, look, we know that you can be asymptomatic, that the incubation period can be a week sometimes as well. Um, but you know, with the temperature taking or until we get more uh, tests that uh, discover whether you've got it quicker or you've had it, um, that's the best well, that, that they can do, really. I, I, think, I think it's quite clear, you know, maybe the Premiership may be able to play behind closed doors if they can have testing and be isolated as a team, but it's a lot of problems. But I think the big, the biggest sort of uh, problem, really, like you say, will be in the amateur game where they don't have that infrastructure and... They can't come together and play any rugby. But it did get, get me thinking that over the last three or four weeks, we've we focused a lot on on players and and you know uh, teams. You know which is the best teams we played with, and, and it would be good at some stage. Maybe next week we'll do the best best international players you've ever played against. Um, I played for ten year, years with England, so I played a lot of people. I, Fortunately, I played against the likes of Jonah Lomo, Yus van der Vestes, and those sort of players. And, and you probably played against uh, more of the current crop. So it would be good to pick my best 15 I played against against yours and see what people think which is best. But I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about coaches, the best coaches, the worst coaches that you may have had at club and country. Um, now, you're a coach yourself. And, you know, what, 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 who inspired you? Who would you look up to in your career, both, you know, at, you know club and country? And, and, and who was... Let's be honest, who wasn't the best? Well, you know, when I look, look we, we, we played in different... We, we probably played in a similar era in terms of how coaching is taking place. Coaching now, like leadership, is, is much more about empowerment and much more about giving responsibility to the players yeah. um, and, you know, using their talents and insight. Whereas when we were playing, you know... We had, there, there was a little bit of that towards the, you know the latter part of my career, but certainly the beginning it was much more dictatorship. It was, probably, it was uh, dictatorship. Yeah, a bit more dictatorship. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but only but to be honest, Brax, that that's needed sometimes, isn't it? Autocracy yeah. because if you've got you know I'm not saying you were low skilled workers, but just talk about in in the sort of working world, if you've got low skilled workers or ones that find it hard to motivate, then they probably need a bit of micromanagement and. Uh, 
That's what yeah. it was, wasn't it? Look, this is the plan. Yeah. This is what you do. There was probably average three or four players that understood the game plan. It would have mm. been the fly half, the scrum half, an intelligent number eight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and maybe another back or back row or whatever it might be, or an intelligent skipper maybe in the second and row. They and they run that's about they it. Run yeah, they people just want people just wanted to know what their jobs were, and, and there's still people that I played with who are actually younger than me that actually prefer that. Mainly Type Five guys, of course, mm. but they want to be told, "I want you to hit 20 rucks a game. I want you to shore up the scrum, do your lifting a line out. If you make, you know, if you make four carries, you make four carries, but don't make that the priority. If you handle the ball or whatever it is, they enjoyed that back in the day when rugby wasn't as fluid as it is now." And you didn't get as many touches on the ball as a front, uh, a tight five forward. But uh, it has changed a lot. But looking back to when, when I was playing, okay. So what, what did I want from a coach? Well, one, um, you, you've got you've got to respect the coach. You've got to look up to the coach, and that, and that you know, and there's d- different ways of that. Maybe track record of the coach, but ultimately it's what they do in the here and now, isn't it? It's the example they set, um, and. Motivation wasn't an issue for me, Brax. I, did, I didn't need these rousing Churchillian speeches. I enjoyed them when they came along once in a while, mm. I, I have to admit, but didn't need that. You know, I, was, I motivated myself. I just loved playing a game. I wanted to go out there, smash someone, um, you know, show what I was about and win, win with my buddies, you know, my team and yeah. celebrate after that. And, you know, you obviously commiserate after a loss. And I, I never really had a problem with that. Um, but I wanted someone that was going to make the team better and had the same ideas as me in terms of where we should go as a team in terms of the type of rugby, but also make me better um, and be absolutely clear on what the game plan was. I always think as a, as a coach, there's two, there's two things a team needs. You might disagree. There's two things a team needs um, before they set foot on the field on a Saturday. Clarity and motivation. I've spoken about the motivational side at a professional level that should come with, with from within sometimes certain individuals or the team might need a bit of poking, um, but not hopefully not very often if you've got the right guys there. But the clarity comes from the coach in terms of the game plan and in terms of, you know, you're going to execute and play as well as you can if you're clear mm. in your role. Um, mm. But, you know, throughout the journey, as I say, if that coach can also make you a better player, and help you understand how you can become a better player for you and your teammates, then those are the best coaches, really. And um, Yeah. So who would you say? If I put put some names, if I put some names from my career, and um, I I talk particularly about club at Harlequins, you know, uh, I had Dean Richards as director of rugby, then Conor O'Shea as director of rugby. Great. Um, And if I talk about the technical stuff or, you know, the tactical stuff, I actually pull it or, or, you know, just being getting better as a player. I actually learn more of the senior players. And I think you do. I think you get better with better players around you. And, you, and I actually learn more of senior players. I had at Quinns and with England. How do you do things? You know, picking their brains. All oh, right. Why do you do this? You know, because they're actually in the cold face. They're, they're, the, they're your sort of peers, if you like. And they're the guys you really look up to and aspire to be. Um, but, if I look back to those two coaches, Dean Richards, Conor O'Shea, very, very different. Very, very different personalities, different ways of running a club, but in their own way. So Dino, you didn't want to let him down. You had great respect for him, great track record. Um, you knew what he wanted in a sort of less than verbal way. Mm. I would say with him, if, if he was talking to you as a player, you you were in trouble. If he didn't talk to you, you were okay. You were getting selected every week. He was happy <laughs> yeah. with how you're playing. You know, he wanted yeah. to have a word with you if he wasn't happy with how you were playing or behaving um, or you were dropped or whatever it might be. Connor O'Shea, you talk about clarity. The guy couldn't have been clearer. When he came to Quinns, this is how we're playing. This is our blueprint. Come what may, this is what we do. And he was very, very good orator um, during the week, before a game, same message, half-time, same message. So you're under no illusions. That's exactly... He didn't try and change it halfway through or second-guess no. himself. Um, neither of them technical coaches or spent much time actually coaching technically on the field. Um, Connor very much liked to, like Brian Ashton at uh, England, wanted the players to figure things out for themselves, figure out the best way. You know, what works for you guys? Because I could tell you the perfect uh, way to pass the ball, catch the ball, tackle you know, go over as a jackal at the breakdown, line out, lift, line out, jump. But actually, it might not work for everyone. Um, And 
and, and well, they were very and they were very similar like that Connor and Brian Ashton in terms of right you figure that out for yourself there but I'll be absolutely clear on what the game plan is and how we're going to stick to it and how we're going to apply it throughout the week and then on the Saturday well you you've talked about uh, club coaches I, I like to talk about my experience in club coaches it'd be good to talk about England because I've I've had a few and you've had a few but uh, I agree I think um you know your peers are very important about about how a team is 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 going to progress and the game plan which is sort of sort of dictated by the leadership group but also the coaches but uh, when i first had started out playing rugby especially in the amateur days in a way it was very much like a dictatorship and i have to say to some extent the new way of coaching and i coach at st albans i have done for 3 years got a fantastic uh, head coach in, in Germany Wormsley from New Zealand, wants to play like the Highlanders, but great coach. And I did, I do find this sort of um, collaboration of coaching where you, you try and get the players to come up with the answers. I find certainly a school rugby quite hard to do because you have to ask them questions. And, and to some extent, sometimes they come back with the wrong answers because a lot of them don't even watch rugby or don't even understand what's happening. So this collaborative approach I found I do find quite hard to make it sort of like, uh, you know, the players come up with a game plan and you're just you're just sort of getting the best out of it in that respect. So I do think there has to be a balance between the collaboration and the dictatorship. But in the early years, when I first started out, we had Mark Evans. I don't know whether you came across him. He was a oh, yeah, mate, he was my, he was my, yeah. He was my yeah. first uh, head coach well, at Quinn. He was, yeah. listen, he was, i tell you what, at Saracens, he was fantastic. He got all of these uh, internationals from around the world. He knew the game inside out. He was very, very intelligent. He it was great working out game plans and what we should do and how we should do it. The problem with Mark was because he never played the game to a higher level, Okay, some of the players like Francois Pinar or Philippe Seller or Tim Horan or whatever, whoever it was, Michael Liner, probably lacked a bit of respect of what he was saying. And in a way, I always felt that he was probably one of the best technical coaches that I'd ever seen and really, really bright and understanding. But unfortunately, it broke down um, later on because there were too many, uh, I, what I would call personalities, who thought they knew better. So he was one of the good ones. The thing is, I've, I've had some, you know, Francois Pina, who was fantastic as a leader for in South Africa. But you can imagine the way the South Africans and you coached out there the way they coach it's it's it, well what I experienced with France I was so much like a dictator because he he not only became um coach he made himself captain as well but also he was the MD and the chief executive right so he got rid of it he ended up having every senior post and the way he dealt dealt with things was a very Africana way we will do this I don't care whether it's working or not working listen he was a great player did great things but actually it didn't quite work with all of these different internationals from different countries. Um, so I think his speciality at the time in South Africa as a leader really worked well because it was, he was the head honcho, we're doing it this way, and everyone followed in South Africa. And I think when he came to Saracens and took over, it became difficult because that's not the way of the world. There's a lot of internationals around the world had different, different you know, uh, Thomas Castagnier, he just couldn't toe the line. He was like, you know, Francois, why have you done that? And he's like, well, because I thought I could score a try and I do this. And That's not the game plan. This is what we're doing. Um, but again, I particularly liked uh, working under Steve Diamond. Um, and I know p perhaps that goes back to the, the sort of dictator stars. Yeah, I, th I think Steve, to be honest, he's doing a great job up at Sale. Uh, he did a great job at Saracens uh, to some extent. But uh, I loved his basic game plan, basic principles. A lot of people have respect for him, understood the game really, really well, perhaps could have um, opened his eyes into being a bit more, a bit more adventurous. Um, but then it's funny when you see, and I know there's a name for it, when, when coaches who assistant coaches who end up getting the, the main job. So Mike Ford, who was our defense coach, who I thought was brilliant, ended up getting the head, uh, Steve Diamond left and he became head coach. And some assistant coach where you think would be great as a head coach don't end up being great head coaches. Uh, that's why I'd be, I'd be really interested to see how um, and Andy for, for Ireland, how he gets on from assistant coach, uh, you know, Andy Farrell to head coach. I think it's a different job. It's a harder job. And Mike Ford suffered that. He didn't quite make it as a head coach when he was at Saracens anyway. 
I had Eddie Jones for a while, and and this is not be, me being necessarily bitter against the man. Um, I, I one thing I disliked about some coaches was the way they played the politics within the team and the club. And what I what I disliked was um, Eddie Jones, and I, and I don't know whether he does it with England or not, but he used to he used to lick up to and praise the senior players to try and get control within the team. And then he used to rinse the young guys. I mean, rinse them like you wouldn't believe. And I find I didn't enjoy that. I thought that was the wrong way to to coach. And and I think from what I hear, it's the way he does it with England as well. He sort of well, like he, must have, he must have come out. He's quite. He's he's, a, he's got a sharp wit, Eddie. He must have come up yeah. with a few. Uh, he must remember a few examples of. Uh, well, no, how he dealt with the youngsters there. Oh, I just remember one of the players. I remember one of the players. He had a cracking game, and he got man of the match. It was one of our fullbacks. I can't remember his name. Yeah, cracking game, and he came off the pitch. We're in the uh, injured change room. We'd won. Everyone's on a high, and this kid, this kid, has scored two tries. And uh, but I think he missed the tackle or something. And he just went, mate. You know, you missed a tackle. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he goes, well, what about my tries? And he goes, no, 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 you missed a tackle, mate. You're not playing next week. And he just rinsed him in front of everyone. Just straight after the game. Oh, it's straight after the game, right? And everyone's like, bloody hell. And then he dropped him for the following week. And I was like, are you serious? He was outstanding. And I don't know why. but li- and, then, and then they do a review. And he'd do a review and he'd go, oh, look how good Kieran was here. Look how good, you know, the senior players. And then he'd just get one of these young kids with a bad pass and he'd be a mate, you got to in in the morning, you're passing half an hour. It was, it was like, but it was his way of gaining control with the right people within the team. So I didn't like that. I didn't like, I sort of like, you know, if I would like a coach to basically call the, the senior players out uh, and basically praise the young ones, irrelevant of where they're standing in the team is. But um, yeah, Francois, I would say, man, I don't, on that, it's, it's a very good point you put because we're, before I went into coaching at Harlequins, one of the, you know, we'd had a couple of bad years. We'd sort of fallen off. We had a good time and Connor left and we are sort of on a slippery slope and uh, sort of just got the views of the players, okay, going into sort of now coaching them. And they yeah. said, well, you know, they didn't like the fact that some some of the coaches there were, uh, did exactly the same, you know, pick on the easy targets. Yes. But actually, when the senior players do something, it's sort of glossed over. So I made sure that I would treat everyone fairly, but actually I think you would get more, uh, more of a kickback in terms of reward if, um, you know, there was an international there and you said, look, you know, this isn't how we want things done. Do you agree? You know, obviously you've got to get their collusion as well uh, in it. You you can't sort of like uh, just suddenly throw it upon them in in, in a room full of 40 people because some of them do have, you know, you know, they, they, they do have a standing amongst them and a status amongst them. But, uh, you know, a lot of the guys there would take it on the chin, but it has a double effect. So what happens is that the guy who's second, third, fourth choice, they go, right, well, actually, if that's how you're meant to do it, that's how I'm going to do it. Whereas yeah. if you went to that second or third choice, the easy target, the youngster, whatever, and you said, well, yeah, the senior player might, so I'm not saying they do, but they might just go, oh, God, yeah, he's let us down again. And he would never have any sort of self-improvement and he would carry on making the same, but you know, mistakes or whatever or, or bad choices in a game and so you, it actually just has a negative effect on the whole environment and obviously the quality of play you're trying to develop as well but it's a way of it is a way of coaches gaining control and my my first coach was um jeff cook way back in 1993 he was a re- really good coach but you could see he was so he had all the you know he had will carling and rob andrew and all these players in his pocket dean richards and and effectively the young guns coming in just got rinsed and but I do remember Jeff Cook would openly praise the young lads. But then when, when Jack Rowell got the coaching and he was coach at uh, Bath and he got the coaching and he was such a nightmare. When you talk about mind games, I remember I played against Canada and um, I made a couple of breaks, scored a try. And he, he basically said to me at the end of the session, he said, stop, stop running down blind alleys. And I was like, what do you mean by that? He said, stop running down blind alleys. Next day he said, stop running down blind alleys. And I had to try and interpret what he was trying to say. What he was trying to say is maybe don't take it on so much yourself. And I remember for the following year, I took it on less. And when I look back, I think, what a twat. Why was I listening to someone like that who, who had such an average game plan? He, he was so average as a coach when it came to how we're going to put. Can you imagine against you know, New Zealand semi-final of the World Cup? 
He didn't even mention Jonah Lomu in the team talk about what we're doing. Didn't think of swapping the wings of Rory Underwood and Tony Underwood. Um, but he was just, he was awful. I mean, I, I was interested though. He, know, um, of, his era, he just, he just wanted the biggest men, didn't he, in the forward back? Yeah, that's all he that wanted. Was, that, was the, that was the 95 World Cup when you had Rod Burke, Clark and Richards in the back row. Yeah. Um, and I know Lomu had the, you know, was suddenly on the, you know, the global stage after that game. But yeah, I think the effect the All Blacks did at the breakdown with Josh Cronfield really showed up that sort of lack of balance, didn't it, for memory? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. But, but and the sort of pace they were playing with due to that as well. But not to speak about Joan alone or even think about switching the wings. It was just, he, he look, okay. He hey, did I remember, well that, mate, I was at school, right? <laughs> when that, yeah. And we had obviously, you know, beaten Australia, last minute drop goal, wasn't it, Rob Andrew? You know, everyone was cock a hoop. And uh, we were taking on the All Blacks. Jonah Lomu was the, you know, he was a superstar of the world. How are we going to stop him? I remember, mate, the rumours going around that Victor Ubergu used to play wing at school and they were thinking of putting him on the right wing again. <laughs> Shut up, Victor Hey, did Ubergu. you not hear that one? Do you not hear that one? No, he was doing no, around no. to school, mate, no, and amongst all my mates right. and the other schools was, yeah, yeah. he's going to play He's going to play Victor on there because apparently he's really quick, actually, deceptively quick, and that he used to play wing at school or something. I, know what, I tell you what I'll go ask you is, um, and I, you know, you might might want to get my opinion on Clive Woodward. I don't think you didn't have Clive Woodward. He, I thought he was a fantastic man manager as opposed to team coach. The great thing about Clive Woodward, what he did, is he got really good coaches around him. Phil Lard, a defence coach. Brian Ashton, uh, while he was there as, as an attack coach and backs coach, he got a uh, scrum coach, he got a line-out coach, he got Dave Allred, kicking coach. You know, he got all these brilliant coaches around him and then just managed from the top. Well, obviously, he had a great team with the captain, Martin Johnson, and um, I think he was a great man-manager as opposed to sort of first-team coach because Andy Robinson was effectively first-team coach. Uh, but I, I, I'd love to ask you about um, you know how one of my sort of coaches in Brian Ashton ended up getting you to the final of the Rugby World Cup. And um, I do remember, well, I think, I suppose the criticism leveled at him was he was all about a bit like the French, uh, where they just, just play what you see, you know, um, just move the ball and uh, basically take people on, play what you see. And there was no structure, yet you wanted structure. And then you took over, I don't know how long before the World Cup, um, final, but how long before the World Cup final? I know you lost against South Africa 36 nil, and I think you all got in a room and said, Listen, we're not doing it that way anymore. Tell us a story how it happened. And, and did yeah, you well, that's to- um, so Brian came in beginning of 2007, and you know, I made my debut two games in. And I enjoyed personally, I enjoyed Brian because I was a very much a heads up player and play what you see. And mm. he brought me in, he didn't try and overcoach you, say, Right, this is what I, you know. This is clearly what your remit is within the England game plan. But, you know, do what you've been doing for your club. That's why I picked your sort of thing. And too many times, you know, when you get into the international arena, that you know, they're they're, they're trying to put, you know, square pegs in round holes, you know, so to speak. It's all like, right, this is what you've been doing for your club. But we don't want you doing that. We want you doing something completely different. Well, you know, you might not suit that England coach or the makeup of the team at the time. So, Mm. yeah, you know, I I enjoyed... Brian, um, but he, but I think with the group of players, you, you, you've got to be able to coach with the cattle you've got. And I think the group of players, very experienced guys there, guys that won World Cups, but England had been a bit disjointed and disbanded for the four years since that. And he brought back a lot of experience there. You know, uh, Mike Cat was in there. Uh, ben Kay was in there. Phil Vickery, Martin Corey, uh, Johnny Wilkinson was back, you know, fit that year you know because he had three years of injuries and you do need direction you know when you're working with 15 players on a pitch at one time and a core group squad of of 30 and a wider squad of 45 when you come into the world cup camps you do need to have clarification of exactly what your identity is what you're going to be best at and you know your strategy as well and within that you can start on picking who your best players are working on you know working on those players, working with those players and everything. But you, you have to be in agreement. And I think ultimately, and, and unfortunately this happened throughout my England career actually, is you had a group of coaches that never agreed on how you should play. Um, Mike Ford, John Wells um, were involved then. Uh, Brian left uh, the Six Nations after World Cup. Jono came in as head coach, who I thought was... Um, 
I loved playing for Jono and I thought he was he was growing into the role really, really well. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, they didn't give him another four years. So I think he's got a terrific amount of rugby knowledge and know-how. And, you know, you're judged on World Cups, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, we didn't do the business in the 2011 one at all. Um, but Brian Smith came in as attack coach for his tenure and they never agreed. You know, it was a very dysfunctional coaching group and you could tell. And unfortunately, when you're getting mixed messages, and I come back to the clarity thing, if you're getting mixed messages, you're not really sure what you're meant to be doing and why you're meant to be doing it and who for, you're not going to perform that well. And you're certainly not going to perform well consistently, which is what you need at the highest level or any level. So how did, how did it work with the coach, though, when, it, when I heard that the players took over? They're They're going back part. to 2007, yeah, basically after that... Um, you know, we had mixed results in a warm-up, you know, scraped through against USA, being humped by South Africa and really embarrassed, you know, for, for world champions. And we just decided, right, you know, you, you know you've got to pull your finger out. What are we doing? You know, how, how are we playing? If you, you know, if you're not going to tell us, this is how we're going to do it. So the players really took, you know, Mike Cat, Ollie Barkley were very, very much at the forefront from an attacking shape perspective because we didn't really know what we were trying to do in attack. Um, you know, from an X team point of view, you know, we had to clarify that. And you think, well, we've had eight weeks together, you know, probably more, 10 weeks together. And it's like, well, there's certain things that should have been ironed out and absolutely clear in terms of uh, what, what we're doing. And, it, and, it's, and it wasn't the case. But because we had such, you know, you, you're, the best, you're the best group in England, you're the best players there, you can pick things up quickly. It's amazing what you can learn when you really put your mind to it or how you can adjust and adapt. Um, and we had two tough games, Tonga and Samoa, um, which never really given credit for. You know, Samoa really did push us. Um, I think we were, we might have been losing or two points ahead or something with 20 to go. And, you know, we had to dig deep and really galvanise. Uh, Tonga pushed us as well and went ahead early in the game. And then we had Australia in the quarter final, and everyone was writing us off because they expected the England that got beaten by South Africa in the group stages. And we turned up, and actually the scoreline flattered them, to be honest. I think we put in a hell of a performance, um, you know, took them on traditionally where we're strong and they're not at the scrum and the breakdown, um, but played some good rugby in that game. And, you know, we made it to the final, beat France on the home patch and as well in the semi final and, and played South Africa and only lost, you know, 15 9 or 15 the 6. Coach, it was, but a much the closer coaches, game. Yeah, but, but the coaches were in the background, weren't they, really? It was literally. Yeah, and, you know, we, we, took, we took over from then. And I suppose it's what Brian was after, really, but uh, he didn't, pos you know, he couldn't have really perceived or imagined that was the way he wanted to go about it. But, they were very much in the background and, uh, you know, they, they still had a big say in what was going on. I remember Mike Ford came in with his game plan against Australia and said, look, I remember specifically George Gregan, he was just saying, because they had a lot of threats to Australia, always have a lot of running threats and you can't mark everything from a defensive point of view. You can't. You've got to trust in a system, make it the, the thing that you can't mark very well, the hardest skill to execute or the hardest thing for the opposition to do. And I remember that game, it was sort of, we were going to get into, you know, the fly half, you know, Gitto at 12. We we're going to get into certain back rowers, but we were going to leave George Gregan because he likes to run the show, but he doesn't actually like to run himself that much. A bit like no, you, he doesn't, no. a bit like you, yeah. Brax. You know, he had a good yeah. pass at the base, but he was never a running threat. Um, didn't have the pace. And, and that, that was the game plan, especially off line outs. And he, he said, look, if he does make a break, we've got enough pace to cover him. Um, but that is the game plan. And so there was a bit of input there, but very much, the, I think the further up you go, um, very much it's it's down to your senior Play players, senior players well, I, well to work. And as you say, and collude with the coaches and, yeah. you know, Eddie Jones, yeah. you said, Jeff Cook, when he came in, if you've got, if you've got that synergy between your head coach and your senior players, um, you're going to be successful. I was just intrigued, though, and I was really disappointed with the, um, I suppose, uh, Martin Johnson for me, you know, best captain I ever had. And if I was ever asked, you know, which player would have the best rugby brain acumen in a game of rugby would be Martin Johnson. And so it would have been a perfect storm for him to go into coaching. And I kind of think... Uh, it's so frustrating to see what happened and what could have been, you know. I'm interested from you because you were coached by him. It seemed to me from the outside, and I wouldn't know, that um, that A, he probably was 
he was a bit green to coaching because um, he didn't take on a like a lengthy role at say Leicester or a big club or whatever. He just got thrown in there when no one else necessarily would do it, and suddenly he was learning from scratch in a way. And it was a shame because I think I think the, what happened was the group of players that he was coaching, those were sort of players who probably didn't really cross over in his era, and therefore. In a way, he was treating the players the way he wanted to treat them. Whether it probably needed to be a bit more like a school teacher or a dictator or whatever. And I think the players let him down. But what, what was he like as a coach, Martin Johnson? As I said, man, I, I I enjoyed Jono. I mean, originally, obviously, he comes in. He is the icon of English rugby. The most, you know, probably, the, well, arguably, we we spoke about this before. You know, the best player England's ever had, and you know, won it, done it, uh, and won it all, isn't he? And um, he, he he adapted to the role. He, cha- he he changed the he passed on the sort of leadership to the to the players. Originally, he was sort of very much like in his captain's role and everything, you know, trying to motivate the troops and everything. But as you say, his his IP is phenomenal in terms, of, especially how to win Test matches. I mean, the guys played yeah. ninety, including British Lions, ninety odd, ninety two, I think it is, and he's probably won about eighty of them, or eighty yeah. percent yeah. definitely. Um, so he knows how to win test matches. As I said, um, you know, it, it, look, I think responsibility has got to be taken. Yeah, look, dysfunctional coaching group never really agreed on, on how they should play and they all wanted their sort of 10 penneth worth. So, so training could be a little bit long. You know, everyone had their half an hour and, you know, sort of didn't want to give their piece of the pie up because they wanted to get their forwards being their defence, be their attack coaching instead, instead of being synchronised and, having a yeah. much more holistic view, they sort of said, right, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to micromanage my area. Whereas actually that's not what was needed. Um, but also, you know, we, we let him down as players. You said it there, Brax, you know, did, did we really push um, for the highest standards? Did we really behave and set the right example? And, you know, did we, did we front up when we needed to um, consistently? No, we didn't. Um, and look, I, w- I would like, personally, I'd like to see him back in a game. Um, I can understand why he's not in the game. I think, uh, you know, he, it, it, took a, it took a lot out of him. Um, it took post. a lot of shit, didn't he? it? Really it interesting. Took, and completely unfairly. And I'll tell you what, what's good, though, is I don't think anyone thought the, the flack he was taking was fair. Um, no one held him fully to account. He would have held himself fully to account. That's the man he is. Um, and I thought he was treated, you know, pretty disgracefully, actually. Um, after that, um, it's a brutal world, though the coaching. It is, it is, world. and, I, and you know, John, John is a big man. He knows that, and you know, I know it myself from coaching as well. It, you know, it's, it's cutthroat, and you, you're there to be sort of shot at, um, and you take so, full but, so, so, so let's ask you the final question to finish off on the coaching. Um, your your favorite, sorry, your your favorite club coach and your favorite. England coach, and I'll do mine. Oh, tough, tough that, mate. I don't know whether we could have favourite because they're different. Uh, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but there are different times in your career. You know, when you're young, you need a different type of uh, pair of eyes and voice overseeing you and, you know, helping you and cajoling you than when you're a bit older, don't you? Um, I actually really enjoyed, you know, when I came back in briefly, I actually did enjoy Stuart Lancaster, Andy Farrell. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. And again, you're judged by A hey, going to World Cup, aren't you? And uh, look, we, we know what happened. Not very good. We Not won't very get good, into mate. that. I think, <laughs> you know, Stuart is a fountain of knowledge in the game. He's found his best role now, hasn't he? And he's always admitted yeah. that. He didn't really like being selector. He never liked no. having to have 70% of his job with sponsors and media, which England job no. is. Um, he wanted to get out there and coach and make players better and bring through the younger guys and everything. And, uh, you know, he, he um, and you could see that actually at the time. And Andy Farrell, I really enjoyed, you know, he was a big motivator, um, really, you know, really positive guy, full of energy. And you just didn't think you could lose um, when it, when he was in your corner, really. Um, yeah. And uh, how about you? You know, you played... I mean, yeah, you played on one club lot. Saracens, didn't you? Um, yeah. You know, you've yeah, spoken to you had Mark Evans, Steve Diamond, but they don't necessarily have to be, you know, your, your favourite coach doesn't necessarily have to be the top man, the head honcho. It could be one of the assistants or, you know, yeah, maybe no, a side I, I, or a skills no, I, I, I think because, um, you know, I grew, up, I grew up up north and um, I sort of had a bit of an affinity with Steve Diamond. 
Um, I, I like what he's trying to do. We just gone really well between him and Mark Evans. If I had to, yeah, I, I think if Mark Evans had played at a higher level, then I think everyone would have responded a little bit better. But I'd say uh, Steve Diamond. And bear in mind, I had Eddie Jones, I had Rod Kafer, Francois Pinar, uh, Mike Forge. So, but I'd say for me, Steve Diamond. That's where I felt a real synergy with the coach, which will probably raise some eyebrows with a lot of people. But uh, but this is, you know, this is personal. When it comes to England, I, I think, the, well, I quite happily say the worst England coach I had was Jack Rowell. He was just a, he was a bit of a joke, really. When I look back at the professional area, and I, I know it was the amateur era, but bloody hell, I mean, the things he used to say, the, you know, it was all about, it's all about the old boy, the grade. And like you say, picking the biggest pack. And he did very well at Bath because they had a great recruitment policy. They just picked, got all the England players there. You know, that's, that was their policy. Get all the England players in, they'll win the matches. Well, of course you're going to win the matches. You've got all the England players. Um, but, you know, as an international coach, I find him, you know, trying to get the best out of me. You know, he basically coached taking people on out of me a little bit. Uh, I should have never listened to him. But probably the best... I would say by some distance, and you know, the, the time was pretty good. Was was Clive Woodward? Uh, maybe it wasn't necessarily what you would call, you know, a, a, a proper coach, coach. Uh, but he had a master plan behind it all. And like you say about clarity, I think that's the most important thing um, when it comes to you know what you want to do as a coach. I mean, myself uh, coaching at St Albans and uh, with Wanstead when it comes, it's about it is about clarity, but it's about getting the best out of the boys. And I kind of feel that. Clive Woodward did that by creating an environment. First of all, the training facilities that we had up at Penny Hill Park compared to where we were. Instead of like going off to Richmond Park and putting some cones out or going to some rugby club where you know you have to wait for someone to come off. It was a disaster in the amateurs. But when he came along, first class facilities, first class uh, um, sort of support. Instead of having one doctor and one physio, we had two doctors, three physio, three masseurs. We had the best coaches from around the world in every little bit. And he just brought it all together. Now, it doesn't work if you haven't got the players. So, you know, the Johnny Wilkinsons, the, the, uh, the Martin Johnson, it does help. But I think he had, a, he had a, a vision of what he wanted. And it was a shame that he didn't get more of a time. I think he got it. It's interesting, though. A blueprint that he had for England, which I think re worked really well and changed. Because everyone, if you remember, no one else had a defence coach. And suddenly everyone had a defence coach. No one else had a kicking coach. Then what happens when you innovate? Everyone changes. No one had the tight jerseys until we did it. Then everyone follows. And he had a vision. It's interesting, though, when that DNA and that blueprint that he had that I think was fantastic didn't work for the Lions when he got hold of the Lions for the New Zealand tour he tried to implement the same sort of things it just didn't we got it completely wrong so uh, it's a shame he didn't have longer with England to create a, he wanted to create a, um, a base for England a proper training facility he wanted to he wanted to essentially contract the players after the World Cup 03 he said that's the future and uh, he you know I still think he he, he could he could get back into coaching if he wanted it uh, because I think he's got a different mindset. I remember one of the weirdest things he ever did. Now, but bear in mind, this is 1997, I think, where he got he became coach. And uh, the first session we had, uh, he, he brought in uh, some strength and conditioning people and he got them to do clean and jerk and deadlifts and everyone was like, what's this all about? And then he got, uh, I think he got Josh Lucy to uh, come to the front and he's only a young lad and he said Josh take off your top so he had to take off his top and he said this is how I want you all to look after we get serious about our strength and conditioning so there's Josh Lucy like parading as this little rent boy or something it was a bit embarrassing I bet, I bet, I bet Jason Leonard enjoyed that oh Jason Leonard thought what the fucking hell's going on here I ain't wearing that tight kit either but yeah, look, he was brilliant. Clyde was brilliant. And uh, I still think he's got something to add. So though, yeah, so from sublime to, to, to absolutely ridiculous of, of, of Jack Rowell. Yeah, well, look, it's, um, it's interesting and uh, t times change as well, as I say, you know, in terms of, you know, society, but also you as a player, you know, the more experience you have, the different sort of needs are required, if any, for, for, from, from, from coaches, you know, that, 
as you, question, as, you say, though, Nick. as you say with Jack Rowell, mate, um, you know, if you get the best players involved, it makes it a hell of a lot easier, doesn't it? And uh, yeah, that's the thing. Ultimately, ultimately, I mean, how how satisfying is it for you as a coach if that's the way you, you, you want to operate? Um, look, you obviously don't want to be losing every week, but uh, trying to improve players and a team and yeah. overachieving, I think, is what success is as a coach. If you help players as individuals and a team overachieve, whatever their level is when you start, you've been successful. Here's the thing, you know, people say to me, you know, people always say, a lot of people want to take away the credit from uh, Clive Woodward by saying, well, you know, anyone could do that. You had Johnny Wilkinson, you had Martin Johnson, Lawrence Lally, the best teams in the world. But actually bringing them together and making it work takes a lot more effort than you think. And it's interesting, you know, when, when I look at the coaching, I'm sure that Eddie Jones is a good coach. But then, you know, I, I, I would question the fact is that I, I still think some players are playing out of position. Um, I think they could, could, could do better. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I know he's very successful. Uh, but, you know, people like Warren Gatland, who have been fantastic with very limited resources, um, and how he's going to, you know, he, he would just say he's the best coach in the world then at the moment if you had to pick someone. Best coach in the world right today. Oh. You have a well, mate. I mean, the best coach in the world could probably be someone we we don't really know. But I'll I'll tell you. I think. Well, I'll tell you what. Before I tell you, I think. I think it's important as well to understand the people you're coaching, Brax. And you said it before, especially cultures. Yeah. You spoke about South Africa, where it's very much it is a dictatorship. It's this is what we do. And when I was out there coaching, I tried to. Make them make them take more responsibility. Figure things out for themselves. And Did they like wasn't, that? Wasn't, and 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 eventually, you know, you you turn their thinking, and we got success from doing that. But it's very much against the culture there. And you know, even at schools, you know, the teacher says this, and that's what you've got to do. And they're happy yeah, to follow yeah. that. And to try and change them out of that takes time. You know, I enjoyed that challenge. New Zealand's very much like that. New Zealand is right. What do you think? Okay, let's explore this. Let's see your idea. Let's see my idea. Okay, now we'll agree. On what we do, as they say, where there's, I think there's a phrase in coaching in there, where there's, where there's doubt, or sorry, where there's certainty, there's doubt, where there's doubt, there's certainty. Meaning, basically, if I say, right, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, what we're doing, and you get some bright spots saying, well, actually, or thinking, I don't fully agree with that. There's a better way of doing this, but you don't allow them to express that opinion. They're actually not going to be committed to doing what you want. So that's where there's certainty, there's doubt. Where there's doubt, there's certainty. Oh, is this the way we should be doing it? Oh, right, you think you should be doing it this way, do you? Okay, well, let's have a look at that. You look at both or more models, then you decide which is best. Suddenly you get the certainty. And they're very much like that, and you don't need to worry about them motivating themselves. The English, we like to ask a lot of questions. You know, uh, I think they like to question quite a lot. Um, and then you've got to try and come to the best solution. I think the Irish are a little bit more enjoy being coached. Um, you know, yeah. from what I understand, I'm not coached over there, but just speaking to a few people that have and their sort of mindset. So um, I think you've got to understand the people you're coaching, the cultures you're coaching. Um, but if you would say who the best coaches are, well, let's have a look at the World Cup. Jamie Joseph, what he's done with Japan. Yeah. I, think, Jamie Joseph. I think the hardest thing he did with Japan was it was a home World Cup and Japan had had the biggest shock in rugby the previous four years under Eddie. And, yeah. and, and that, that's where if they were the Cup, if they, if they were the home World Cup and Japan had, hadn't beaten South Africa in the Premier League, it was a little bit less pressure. But he took that on. He moved their game forward. He employed some very good coaches yeah. as well. Tony Brown, the attack coach yeah. I've heard, is an absolute genius. Um, he brought in uh, got the Hurricanes coach, kind of John Plumtree as defence coach as well, or forwards coach. That coaching unit did brilliantly with Japan. And, uh, you yeah, know, they amazing. Beat, uh, they beat Scotland. They weren't too far off about, uh, with South Africa. South Africa obviously bullied them, knew, knew not yeah. to make it an open game. Um, and I think at the currently, if you were to look just from a glo uh, from an international game, they would probably be up there. But there's some great coaches around, some great coaches around. Well, I, 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 listen, that's a, that's a great. I didn't. Even yeah, we had we had one of them on last week, didn't we? Sean Edwards, you know, who's, yeah. who's been there and done it. You know, I, I didn't even mention him. Warren Gatland. Yeah. Eddie Jones. To, that's yeah. right. If you were to get your probably your perfect team, you probably have. You might have Stuart Lancaster, Jamie Joseph, Sean Edwards, and uh, I don't know Warren Gat or some. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. I mean, there's tremendous yeah. coaches out there. Yeah. Okay, that's almost it for Rocket. This week's interviews will be released on Friday. But here's a sneak peek 
of our conversations with Tom Curry and Sir Ian Botham. So it's complete garbage, isn't it? Because, as you say, the ball gets passed around all the time. So um, where do you draw the line? If it goes into the crowd, you know, do you have to change that ball because it's been in the crowd? I mean, it's just it's a never ending, isn't it? You, you and Ben, right? Who's playing six? Who's playing seven at Sale? Oh, it's kind of changed. It used to be Ben was probably better at adapting to six when we first started. So I'd play seven, Ben would play six. And now it's probably kind of changed as far as I'll play six and he'll probably play seven, probably because I can jump and he can't. Rocket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter, the brand new rugby podcast. You don't want to miss those interviews on Friday. We'll also be putting them on YouTube. So make sure you search for Rocket and subscribe. Now to end today's episode, we're joined by England international Sarah Beckett. Hello, Sarah. Hello, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, thanks for joining myself and Kieran on Racket. How are you doing, Sarah? Yeah, I'm good. You're all right. No, yeah. Quinn's another another Quinn's number eight legend here. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been at Waterloo as well, Kieran, so don't feel left out. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's where it all started for me. Yeah, that's where it started for me as well. Good ground, good ground Waterloo. Yeah, I love Played it. There. I played there actually. Back in the oral days, how you been coping with lockdown anyway? Yeah, no, like everyone else, I think um, uh, just training when when we can, trying to stay fit, and um, just finding new things to do. Um, I'm lucky enough to be with my brother and sister and my dad, so yeah, um, oh, plenty cool. of people to keep me company. What Family random stuff around. are you doing? What what sort of random stuff are you doing to keep fit? I'm intrigued, innovative um, ways. I bought a keyboard to try and learn that, but it's not gone very well, oh. if I'm honest. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no Elton John coming up, but um, no, just being, I'd say, like, um, I tried juggling, um, I've got a Nintendo Switch, so I've been playing Mario Kart on that, um, linking up with cool. some of the girls who, like, Shauna Brown in the England squad plays at Quinn's as well, uh, yeah. been racing here on that, so, um, yeah. Well, Nick, Nick Easter, Nick Easter just learned, I think he just learned for the first time to play FIFA and he played it online. Nick, you, you weren't very good though, were you, Nick? Mate, I was actually very proud of my performance. Um, dignity in defeat. Yeah, I've never never played it. Did it for <laughs> NHS charities a couple of weeks ago. Oh, nice. Who did you play as? I played as Portugal and Josh Butler, the England cricketer, he was, yeah. he was England, of course. Oh, of course he was. Um, you got Ronaldo though. I know, but listen to this. This is this is this is we're talking about coaching on this program. Actually, this is how bad a decision I made in selection. <laughs> Ronaldo's obviously a striker, yeah. And I switched him with um, Pereira, who's your uh, you know your sweeper, because I just thought I I thought well I'm not going to get many touches up front because I've never played this game. Before. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I'm going to be mainly defending. So if I'm going to do anything, yeah. Ronaldo's going to dribble it out of defence and be a one-man show. And I'm just going to use his, obviously, avatar skills to oh, um, no. win this game. I actually had a hell of a lot of opportunities <laughs> up front. Prayer was absolutely useless. Nothing to do with the person. <laughs> of course, nothing to do with me. No, what was the score? No, no, no. Tell us the score. So, so, no oh. excuses. What was the score? 4-0. Uh, 2-0. <laughs> Two nil each half. People were getting smashed ten nil, mate. I was expecting a ten. <laughs> I was expecting a ten. I never played it before. That's not Again, super focus, isn't it? These, cricket, these cricketers spend a long time on tour playing it, you know. <laughs> so you got a song for us. This uh, feels yeah, like, yeah, feels like X Factor or Britain's Got Talent. Is it with your? Is it with your keyboard? Is it with your keyboard? No, it's definitely not my keyboard. You'd be getting nothing out of that. No, <laughs> oh, I've got right, my guitar. Okay. Um, I'm going to sing "Fast Car" by Tracy Chapman. Love um, it. So, oh, that's okay. You got a fast car. I want to take it to anywhere. Maybe together we can get somewhere. Any place is better. Start from zero, got nothing to lose. Maybe we'll make something. Me and myself, I got nothing to prove. You got a fast car. I got a plan to get us out of here. We can have a 
Man, she say you're just a little bit of money Won't have to drive too far Just across the border and into the city You and I can both get a job Finally say you ain't miss to be living You see, my old man's got a problem Yeah, with the violence for eight and six months old his boy's too young to look like his mama went off and left him. Woman was from life him, he could get a sense. Someone's gotta take care of him. So I quit school and that's what I did. You got a fast car, so fast enough so we can fly away. We gotta make a decision. Leave tonight and learn to die this way. Do you remember when we were driving, driving in your car? Still so fast, I feel like I was driving. City lights, the apples, and all the lights fell on my shoulder. I had a feeling that I was walking. I had a feeling that I could be someone, be someone, be someone. Fast enough so we can fly away. We gonna make a decision. Leave tonight and live and die this way. Yeah! <laughs> well Andy. done. Oh my God. Outstanding. Just... You're taking out on the bus. Are you the musical uh, entertainer? No, they get no, the bus I don't every actually time. like, I don't like falling in front of people, so I try and keep it in Sorry, my bedroom. I, <laughs> Nick, Nick, do you know what I was thinking when you said that? I was thinking to myself, holy cow, can you imagine? You just had a win. You're in the changing room and she comes out and starts singing that. Well, I mean, you must, listen, you've got to do that because that's <laughs> just the life and soul of the team. Yeah. What do you reckon, Nick? A lot of respect, a lot of respect for anyone that's got any musical talent whatsoever. Very jealous and uh, oh, thank you. great performance. Thank you very much. Yeah, really no, good. cheers. Really thank you for having good. me, guys. No problem. Well, stay Please. safe and secure yeah, and uh, hopefully, you know, rugby and all sports and the world will be, will be back at it very soon. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you, Thanks guys. Thanks a lot. Cheers. 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 The brand new rugby podcast. Rocket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. Thanks for listening to Rocket. Don't forget to listen to our interviews with Tom Curry and Sir Ian Botham this Friday. Please subscribe, review and follow us on at Twitter at Rocket underscore podcast.